Welcome everybody to the Johnson Matthey Platinum Group Metals Conference, Critical to the Future of Sustainable Technology. So what is the role of PGMs in the future technologies or those technologies that are going to allow us to have a beautiful, sustainable and successful future as human beings on our wonderful planet? My name is Dr. Sarah Gordon. Now, before we get started, or basically the bit that you have all been waiting for, because of course this is a conference and Emma, I'm going to invite you to maybe say some words against this particular slide. Uh, because of course this is a Johnson Matthey conference, there is a little bit of a legal disclaimer we need to flash up at the beginning in front of you. We will put this into chat as well if any of you want to read this in detail. Um, and our final uh, speaker that we have for you this afternoon, before we go into our debate about the critical materials needed for both batteries and of course those fuel cells, we have Chris Hardacre. Now, Chris, if you have your slides, etc., if you want to start hit sharing now, um, or we can help you in the background, um, now is the moment to click those buttons. But we're really excited because Chris Hardacre is the Vice Dean and Head of the School of Natural Sciences at the University of Manchester. So we're coming back across the Atlantic to the UK. Um, and what um, Chris is going to speak about, as you can see on the slides in front of you, is the photo catalytic conversion of biomass to hydrogen. So we've been talking a lot about hydrogen today. Now let's hear about hydrogen from a slightly different direction. So everyone, please put your hands together for the fantastic Professor Chris Hardacre. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much indeed, Sarah, and, and for all of the organisers for your um, your invitation to, to, have a, to give a talk at this conference. Um, I'm going to talk about as it says there, photocatalytic conversion of biomass to hydrogen. And, and, and the key thing is, is, is the blue sky that you can see above the University of Manchester in the picture. Of course, it's always blue sky, apart from when the cricket is on on Saturday when, and uh, when it's going to absolutely pour down. But, you know, uh, we can convert hydrogen, uh, convert biomass into hydrogen using solar light. So obviously we have a range of sources of hydrogen um, that we can utilize. Uh, we need some way of, of, of putting energy in, and that might be um, electricity. It can, that can be from solar, it can be from wind, it can be a geothermal, um, and it can be from fossil fuels, of course. We can also produce our, our hydrogen from reforming processes, and I'll go through that in a second. And that can be through um, natural gas, of course, which is the predominant source of hydrogen, um, but we want to obviously do it in a more sustainable manner. Um, some of the talks will have talked about uh, how the, what the form of that hydrogen needs to be for, uh, for things like uh, fuel cells and so on. Um, and hydrogen storage is a key aspect of how we might then uh, utilize that hydrogen, uh, whether it's be through uh, pressurized containers or putting them into porous media. But of course, you can have the hydrogen stored uh, in chemicals, so biomass being one of those, and that can be transported around and you can generate the hydrogen at will, um, depending on how you're going to do that. And of course, the usage is in, in a many different uh, aspects of, of, of our consumer life whether that be in cars or transportation more generally or mobile phones or, or we might be able to use the hydrogen in uh, industrial uh, applications as well. Our problem is really um, one of scale. Uh, you can, I don't need to tell this audience uh, uh, too much about this slide, but this is the BP forecast um, for 2030 where You've got this problem on the left hand side here of increasing energy demand doubling between 1990 and 2030. And whilst on the bottom right hand side here, you have the distribution of how the energy might be made up. And that's um, changing from uh, the fossil fuel distribution to something more renewable. Um, if you start multiplying these percentages over on the right hand side, by the increase in the energy, what you find is that, of course, coal, natural gas, and oil still make up a very large amount 
of the tons of oil the equivalent that you require uh, moving forward unless you can get your fuels and and chemicals from a, a different source and one of those sources can be biomass of course so we have this idea of the hydrogen economy um, and this is associated of course with with using hydrogen as a fuel but hydrogen has a very big part to play in chemical production as well as well as liquid fuels moving forward too and the question is where are you going to produce that hydrogen from if we look at the difference between biomass and petrochemicals you can see it very clearly in the center here petrochemicals are hydrocarbons they contain carbon and hydrogen predominantly with very low levels of oxygenation or nitration etc um, are in the in the molecules themselves whereas biomass uh, is mainly made up of carbohydrate like molecules which contain significant amounts of of, of oxygen and so whilst the uh, the challenge that you have with hydrocarbons may need to be putting oxygen in where where you want it selectively to produce particular chemicals your issue with hydrocarbon with with biomass derived hydrocarbons is the removal of that oxygen and so therefore if you're going to remove that oxygen you need to be doing a reduction and you need to use something like hydrogen to be able to do that especially if you're going to have drop-in products um, drop in fuels or drop in chemicals uh, that are akin to what you might get from fossil fuels. Here are the two main components of biomass. You have lignin on the left and you have cellulose on the right. And there is also hem hemicellulose and, and, and essential oils and so on that you have in biomass. But essentially, you can see the two main components and it gives you an idea about the amount of oxygen compared with the carbons and the hydrogens that you have there in both cellulose, which contains huge amounts of oxygen and slightly less amounts of oxygen per carbon in the case of, of the case of lignin. One of the things that you also see is that the amount of functionality that you have in these uh, molecules is very high. These are very complex biopolymers, in particular in the case of lignin. And uh, the CEO of DuPont said, you know, you can make anything you like out of lignin except for money and that's because the molecule is very 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 significantly prone to cross polymerization especially as you start to treat the the biopolymer and therefore you can make it even less tractable to cracking um, and uh, hydrogen production moving forward so how are we going to produce our hydrogen uh, we have obviously water splitting is one of those cases um, but we also have um, uh, but reforming processes. The top ones are reforming processes uh, where we will just take oil or natural gas or coal and make the hydrogen the way that we would do it conventionally, uh, that we've been doing it for many, many years. You can, in the centre, do electro electrolysis of water using solar electricity or hydroelectricity or wind or wave and so on. Those electrolyzers work okay and you produce hydrogen from water. But we can also do reforming of biomass. And that can be gas phase reforming to form biogas, for example. So uh, meet the biomethane, and then you use the biomethane to produce hydrogen. But and I'll go through that in a second. Or you can do photocatalytic uh, reforming of biomass. And that's where I'm going to talk mainly today. So here you have uh, a slide which, which talks a little bit about. The types of sustainable bio biomass or bio to hydrogen uh, production that we can do. You can do steam reforming of alcohols or bioalcohols or biogas, as I've just said. First generation of biofuels you can also take into hydrogen or be able to make fuels with, and that would have been biodiesel production. The issue that you've got with uh, the first generation of biofuels is the problem of the food versus fuel debate many of these biofuels were using um, crops that could have been used for, for food and therefore it was a case of are you going to are you going to feed the population or are you going to power the population the second generation of biofuels 
was uh, associated with lignocellulosic biomass, which contained cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. I've shown you the cellulose and lignin structures. And taking that cellulose and removing it from the, from the biomass allows you to produce hydrogen from it. And as it says there, the most abundant biopolymer on Earth is cellulose. You can do that via water for gasification, aqueous phase reforming processes, arc fermentation, or enzymatic photoproduction. Um, aqueous phase reforming is done at a large scale. Um, it produces quite a lot of other products, though, as well. In the case of uh, in the case of biomass, uh, some of the other processes are uh, a little bit slow potentially. Dark fermentation and enzymatic photoproduction uh, can be quite slow. But the one I'm going to focus on is the use of a photocatalyst to do uh, aqueous phase reforming from a solar perspective. I can't change my slide. There we go. So what are we going to be doing? We're going to be using a, a photocatalytic semiconductor, um, something like titania, zinc oxide, these types of molecules or, or materials, sorry. And that's shown in the top right-hand corner here. I hope you can see my, my mouse. Um, what you have is a semiconductor where you have a valence band and a conduction band. You irradiate that semiconductor using light. The, that allows you to promote an electron from the valence band to the conduction band. The electron allows and the hole uh, allows you then to do oxidation reduction reactions. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to reduce down what is happening here in the gray circles, the recombination of the electron and the hole. So, the, um, so what you want to do is try and capture the electron using um, electron accepting species, and you want to capture the whole um, using electron donating species. So one way to do that is to add sacrificial agents. And in our case, what we're going to use is the biomass as our sacrificial agent um, to be able to effectively do water splitting, uh, but maintaining the, um, maintaining the electron hole pair using the biomass as the as the as the control agent and does it work well cellulose itself is made up of effectively a series of glucose units so you can take sugars and you can put them into uh, water uh, with um, in this particular case we have a platinum on titania catalyst it's uh, the titania is p25 and you can see that you get reasonable production rates of hydrogen using really relatively low levels of glucose in solution. This can be done with platinum, it can be done with palladium, and it can be done with rhodium. Most of the work that I'll show you today, uh, it will be based on platinum, um, but as I say, palladium and um, rhodium work very well. One of, the one of the reasons why you require the platinum is that that allows you to um, keep the electron hole recombination rate lower, it also allows you to have a, a stronger absorption of the uh, of the the biomass, and it allows the hydrogen um, atoms that you form via the aqueous phase photoreforming to recombine. We do. We we then had a look at the um, the effect of not using glucose, which is a nice soluble sugar, of course, and putting in the uh, water some cellulose. Cellulose is a good whole scavenger. Um, it can be oxidized relatively straightforwardly, but it is in the solid phase. So now you have a combination between uh, a solid catalyst, a solid uh, biomass, water, light, and um, trying to produce hydrogen. Again, you can produce hydrogen relatively easily. You can see here um, the squares and the triangles and the diamonds, um, reproducible data, associated with cellulose, microcrystalline cellulose in, in, in water. And this is compared with the water splitting rate over this particular catalyst, which is extremely low. So this isn't water splitting per se, it is cellulose accelerated water splitting, then utilization of the oxygen that you have in the water, in the water to do the oxidation of the cellulose thereafter. But the question, therefore, is: Are you doing 
cellulose photoreforming or are you using a, a solubilized species? So we had done some um, work where we looked at um, pretreatment and some filtered cellulose. And you can see here that without the pretreatment, you got a, a nice linear rate. With the filtered cellulose, um, you uh, got a much more increased rate compared with the aqueous filtrate. And this is associated with the cellulose themselves, um, um, the cellulose themselves having uh, the responsibility for the hydrogen. But what you do notice is that with the, the filtered cellulose, you get this induction period, and we associate that induction, induction period with some, some of the solubilized um, sugars, for example, reducing down the platinum um, via themselves being oxidized. But really, the hydrogen is coming from, from the cellulose photoreforming. But of course, you don't just have cellulose. Uh, you have sugars, you have acids, alde aldehydes, and so on. And this graph shows, or this plot shows you um, that cellulose, while cellulose does give you significant amounts of hydrogen being produced, um, if you have sugars or, whoops, I'll go backwards, if you have sugars or acids and aldehydes present, you, you will get those photoreforming much more rapidly. So if you can split the cellulose up, you will significantly get um, higher rates of hydrogen production. It also shows you in red the difference between the platinized titania and the titania on its own. And the platinized titania gives you much, much higher rates uh, for these acids and aldehydes, for example, than the titania on its own. And that's associated with this electron hole pair recombination. The reaction works like this. You have the band gap in your semiconductor, as you see here, you excite the electron into the conduction band. Uh, you get recombination of the protons form hydrogen over the platinum, and the uh, water then gets um, oxidized. The uh, oxidized product, which is OH, for example, again get oxidizes the cellulose to glucose and so on, and eventually to CO2. We see very, very little CO being formed in these processes, unlike in the case of gas phase reforming. We also see very few byproducts. Um, the vast majority of systems go directly to CO2 and hydrogen. Now, you don't really want to have to do too much pretreatment of your biomass. You'd prefer to be able to use uh, biomass or biomass on its own. And this is just some grass from my garden, where we did some grass photoreforming. And you can see whilst it's slightly lower than the cellulose photoreforming, it does work perfectly well. And that's just simply grass taken, um, dried, put into water, and then photoreformed. What is interesting, however, is that the way that the biomass is produced makes a massive difference to the rate at which you form the hydrogen. And this is associated with the accessibility of the, the biomass to water. You can see here some willow samples, um, depending on whether they were grown in the Cheviot, so in the south of England or they were grown in the north of England in Weatherby, uh, or mixed um, um, Weatherby chips, which were, which were dried and aged over, over a couple of years or so. You can see there's large differences in the amount of hydrogen production compared with the Ross Cheviot, uh, where you're getting about 0.5 micromoles per hour. You're reaching up to seven and a half micromoles per hour uh, in the case of raw, uh, the, uh, in the case of these uh, mixed um, Willow uh, Weatherby chips. All of these are from willow. They're all the same type of willow. It's just ground. It's just grown in slightly different conditions. Actual um, differences in the components of the biomass are shown here. Um, hemicellulose is by far the easiest thing to photoreform, followed by cellulose. This compares with the mixed chips that I just showed you a second ago. And if you start making up physical mixtures, of the biomass composition that you have in the mixed chips, what you find is that the physical mixture has a very much higher hydrogen production than in the mixed chips themselves. Lignin hardly gives you any um, hydrogen. And this shows that the, 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 the way that the biomass is made up and the polymerization within that biomass makes a big difference 
to the amount of hydrogen that produced and the rate at which it happens. The real answer to why this happens is associated with, with the accessibility. Um, and this graph shows you effectively some T1, T2 relaxometry uh, data that we have for the interaction of water with the biomass for a range of different biomass um, um, samples that we've got there. Some of these are miscanthus, some of these are willow samples grown in the different conditions. And what you see here is that you have a, a, a reasonable correlation with the more interaction you can get with water and the biomass, the higher the hydrogen production rate that you have. And I guess that's probably understandable, given that the water uh, and the OH has to crack the biomass to be able to produce the hydrogen in the first place. But it does give you an idea that that is what you need to control. Of course, you don't just do it from biomass, you can do it from waste materials as well. And this is some work that has been looked at in terms of PET hydrolysis. So waste plastic hydrolysis using water and a catalyst produces ethylene glycol and terephthalic acid. Terephthalic acid normally is a poison for photoreforming catalysts. But you can see here that, um, that if, you have, if you have the right combination between terephthalic acid in the uh, in, in in solution compared with then you don't you can actually get a promotion effect so the purple bars are when you only have ethylene glycol the green bars are when you have terephthalic acid at small concentrations of ethylene glycol you get an inhibition effect whereas at larger concentrations you get quite a substantial promotion effect and this is actually a a, a, a an industrial sample that we or industrial set of uh, conditions that we were looking at and so you can produce hydrogen at a reasonable rate uh, from the wastewater that you that you form from things like PET hydrolysis. Now of course it's not just about the hydrogen itself it's also about the pure of the purity of that hydrogen and if you're going to do steam reforming so gas phase reforming of alcohols, bioalcohols, or biogas, you will produce a mixture of not only hydrogen, but also other things, including CO2, but most importantly, including CO. You've got to be able to um, purify that hydrogen for, the, for it to be able to use in fuel cells or in many industrial applications. And you do that via a couple of, uh, of shift conversions and then a hydrogen purification step. The key thing is the second hydrogen purification step had to be done at low temperature. And this is a typical set of uh, thermal water gas shift reactions um, using a range of catalysts. And what you want to be doing is operating down at these sorts of temperatures at 100 Celsius to get pure hydrogen, as shown by the equilibrium line in black here. We haven't quite got there with our gold on Sierra Zirconia under thermal conditions, although it is reasonably active at 100 Celsius. Um, what you are interested, what we were interested in was whether we could do this at low temperatures and we went to electrification of, of uh, systems using non-thermal plasmas to be able to do that. And what you get is that at room temperature or close to room temperature, we can get very high conversions using that same hold on steria zirconia catalyst that I was showing you thermally a moment ago, but actually uh, using non-thermal plasmas, giving you 70-odd percent conversion rather than 20-odd percent conversion, which allows you, obviously, to purify your hydrogen at low temperature uh, under, under selective conditions as well. And I just wanted to finish with a slide that, that demonstrates why you do need hydrogen, not just for fuel cells, et cetera, but also for conversion and the, and the production of sustainable fuels in you know, for example, sustainable aviation fuels or drop-in fuels for vehicles. Want to use waste, um, not useful biomass, so you don't want to use things that can be used for construction. They can be made into triglycerides and fatty acids, but then you need biohydrogen um, to be able to convert those into alkanes and alcohols and eventually into speciality chemicals. And the key thing is you want to be able to use a sustainable way of doing the energy conversion. You want to be able to use catalysts, uh, not things like mineral bases or acids, and you want to use electrical 
or light-driven processes, and I've shown you a couple of examples of those just a moment ago. So in conclusion, um, what I would say is that we can utilize biomass to produce hydrogen, as well as uh, a range of different chemicals, including drop-in fuels. Um, but the biomass um, conditions that it's grown in uh, need to be looked at in detail. You can do this on a distributed, small-scale production. So you could do this where you don't have a lot of infrastructure, for example, in remote rural districts or up mountains, et cetera, et cetera, or in the desert, um, where you might have biomass being able to be utilised, but, but, um, but not a lot else around you. Um, you do need to look at the accessibility of that uh, biomass to things like water in the photoreforming processes, and that will depend on the growing conditions and the type of biomass that you have. If you can improve that, you can increase the um, hydrogen production rates quite substantially, and we can use electrification to, to then clean up that hydrogen if you're going to do it from steam reforming, for example. This leaves me to acknowledge all the people who did did the work in um, in producing the the slides today. Um, it's been a, a combination of, of of both academic groups um, from Imperial College, for example, Queen's University Belfast, and and Manchester as part of the Supergen Bioenergy Network. Um, but also, uh, we've been very lucky to uh, link in with um, the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, Roth Hampstead as well as Energy Cox Consultancy, who provided the, the range of biomass uh, that we looked at. And with that, I will say thank you very much for listening. Thank you again for inviting me, and I'm happy to answer any questions.